dark site. You rush through the open three and uh, travel two. They'll come back at the town. They, like I said, I think the Bulls have reached a point there. If even if they don't win the MAC, they'll still make the NCAA tournament. So, let's talk about UB's popularity. Uh, they, 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 they are getting more and more popular here in Washington, New York. They got post game coverage on the after the on WGR after the post game show with the Sabers. Um. And they're the same as post game show, so this might be what it takes. Syracuse is New York's college team. You won't get any attention in New York City until they beat the Syracuse the Orange to the Dome. Um, I would like to see you be upgrade the football stadium. My dream scenario would be for the basketball team to play at Key Bank Center, for the football team to play at New York Field. But it's, it's more of a pipe dream, just like you be entering a big toe conference. A Power 5 conference. Alumni Arena holds 6,100. 6, it was big enough for a Power Conference team. I, some people wouldn't want to go to a big arena. College Hoops is, better, is best in small spaces. Alumni Arena is perfectly built for that. And there's plus something special for the arena, the arena the campus. As far as Syracuse goes, um, I like Syracuse to get together and help UB's resume. It's a typical U but it's a typical Jim Boheim year. They lose to teams like UConn and Old Dominion, but they also win some big games. They yo yo in and out of the top twenty five and then they then be on the bubble come tournament time. They make it in because they're Syracuse and they make it in the tourney. Rinse and repeat. For the past five years, Syracuse has snuck in, but they're six all time win percentage in college basketball history. They get in because they win enough. But that program has struggled since the last national championship in 2003. The, the Orange get in when other teams wouldn't, and you probably shouldn't because the committee knows Syracuse always shows up in March, where a lot of the teams in the bubble will get blown out. It's all about revenue. They know the South tickets and the merch service over a small school that deserves a spot over them. So, about UB's popularity. Are they getting, are they getting more TV ratings and uh, radio time? But really, unless they join a Power 5 conference, they'll always be, which is unlikely, they'll always be in the shadow of the Build and Sabres. So, um, UB was never in, uh, until the FCS, never joined the Division 1 until the 90s. And they spent the majority of that time as irrelevant. I know the Bills and Sabres have struggled the majority of the last 20 years, but UB was in the matter. They never had, never really had a chance. And now they're just finally getting good. Um, they're having a great year. The, the number 14, they got a huge game against uh, Marquette. Wait, um, not, did I get it right? You, Marquette? Well, right now, hit me on Twitter at JRED Show. Um, God, who's the number 21 team in the country? Well, the, the UB football team is going to be in the Dollar General Bowl against Troy, but the basketball team will be um, facing, yeah, number 20 Marquette. So that's a, a once again another step in stall to prove that they're for real. This team, the U, this team is good, but can they make it deep? Can they be this year's loyal Chicago? Can they be the first mid-major school um, to um, win a national championship in a long time? This is why the Bills were always. This is what, why the biggest reason the Bulls are always in the shadow of the Bills and Sabers. The Bills were within a field goal of winning the Super Bowl back in 1990. They made it three other times. The Sabres have come close to the Stanley Cup, but will you be make, make a, nat a national run? Can they compete with the top schools like Duke, like Kansas, like Tennessee? It'd be a, as good as they are, it would be an astronomical miracle, like Leicester City winning the, winning the Premier League. I mean, anything can happen there. They do look good, but what could, how do they get more popularity? What can they do to get more popularity in Buffalo? Or are they always be in the shadow of the Bills and Sayers? Hey, man, Twitter at J Red Show. Well, anyhow, I'm now to do some other sports talks around the nation, around the nation, around the globe. <laughs> Before we head out. Um, so, anyhow, what are your thoughts on that? Hey, man, Twitter at J Red Show. Let's hour some fantasy football. <laughs> no quarterback scored more than 30 fantasy points. The first time this happened all season long. We had some bad passing performance from Tom Brady, who had 15. Aaron Rodgers had 12. 
Jared Goff had 10, Andrew Luck had 9, Breeze had 6, and Newton had 4. Goff has really regressed as the last couple of weeks. But I think the offensive line isn't helping him. The problem with the Rams is that you, they get punched in the face. They get knocked down easily. And I just think the two men... I was thinking we were going to get L.A. Super Bowl Rams versus Chargers, but L.A. just gets just knocked down too easily. And right back, we saw a dismal week from Saquon Barkley, Leonard Fournette, Philip Lindsay, James White, Sonia Michael. These receivers have struggled... A lot of receivers struggled at the wrong time as well. Like, Hill, Cooper... Josh Allen had probably one of the best fantasy games of the week. 24.5 fantasy points. He had at least seven. It was 99 rushing yards. While it's hard to bank on to s- some running quarterbacks against New England, Deshaun Watson had eight carries for 40 yards. Blake Bortles had 35 carries. Mitchell Trubisky had six carries. Has some success. They did have some success. So I don't like Allen in one quarterback leads, but I would start him in, in, on the road against New England. Sam Darnold has one of his best games against week 15 against Houston. It was 24 for 38. 253 yards and two touchdowns. He has a chance for a solid encore against the Packers. As of right now, I like Josh Allen over easily better than Josh Rosen. I think he's neck and neck with Sam Darnold, but the best quarterback or the rookie quarterback so far is um, Baker Mayfield. Nick Foles didn't have a great fantasy game in Week 15 versus the Rams, but he played well, completing 24 31 passes for 27 yards, no touchdowns and interception. He only scored eight fantasy points, but he could be an option in two quarterback leagues. Texas are playing consecutive row games this week. Derek Carr was let down in week 15 against Cincinnati, which snapped a two-game streak of him scoring at least 22 points. He should have had a chance. He should have a chance to rebound at home in week 16 against the Broncos or deal with multiple injuries. Carr has at least 22 fantasy points. Running backs, um, Elijah McGuire is a good player. We've been talking about McGuire up for weeks. He's finally delivering it with Isaiah Crawl out for the season. He scored in consecutive games and crawled so he got hurt against Buffalo. And he has 35 carries for two yards. Jamal Williams, um, with Aaron Jones not expected to play in Week 15, we should see Williams once again feature as a role for the Packers. Williams played well in Week 15 against Chicago. The Jones got hurt for 12 carries, 55 yards. Williams started the first two games of the season with Jones suspended, but struggled to score and combined 13 PPR points. Kalen Barrett, with Gore out, the Dolphins appear ready to give Bullock the big role ahead of Darren Craig. It's a little odd that Craig isn't expected to get the majority of touches, but Bilal took over Gore from Week 15 in Minnesota and played well. He had 12 carries for 23 yards. I'm still expecting Drake to get a slight bump into the workload. Keith Ford. Ford could be the last man standing for the Bills and McCoy and Reed out for the out, out for the week. So the Bills are in trouble with the running backs. John Kelly's a good player. It's worth to speculate on Kelly just in the case the Rams side to play it safe and Russ Gurley. As of Mo- Gurley is expected to play against the Cardinals, but at week 17, you can see Kelly go in. Same thing with Alfred Blue. I, I think the Rams should rest Gurley. I think they got everything locked up. And try to get, try to get Jared Goff back on track for the playoffs. They got to prove that O-line. I put Davis ahead of Kelly and Blue if you need someone to go. Mike, da- Mike Davis ahead of Kelly and Blue if you need someone this week. As long as Gurley and Miller are playing, it's also contended on Penny at being out as well. In week 15 in San Francisco, despite Chris Carlson going off 22 carries for 119 yards, Davis still has a production ga- productive game. Uh, Kat Dixon, another player. Dixon is playing on the 10 with Gus Ed- Edwards and um, the Ravens. But it could be needed if Baltimore is chasing points because of the Chargers. Zach Zanner, you don't want to trust Detroit's running back in week 16, especially with a matchup against Minnesota. But Zenner appears to have taken over as the leading running back for the Lions. Finally, Darren Sproles for the running backs. Sproles' two game. Um, streak ended with week 15, but he's still involved with three carries. So wide receivers, um, Heath Cummings was all over Anderson, having a great game in week 15 against Houston. And he finished with seven catches for 96 yards. He now has seven targets in three games against the Bills and Texans. Darnold is leading Anderson as well, we hope. So he's a good target for Sam Darnold. He's a big reason why Darnold's looking great. Jordy Nelson's another player for the, Ra- for the Ra- Raiders. Nelson has turned things around the past three weeks. He's got a valuable fantasy option in all these. He has 26 targets for 22 carries. This week he's facing the Broncos secondary. Oh, uh, one other thing. Nathan Peterman has joined the, signed the, with the Oakland Raiders. A lot of former Bills players have joined the Raiders. For, for, for Peterman, Lossman, Edwards. Was it with Oakland and former Buffalo Bills quarterbacks? Robert Foss has been great for the... Been Josh Allen's greatest target. Um... 
And his pass game is 13 PPR points. So he's, he, if you if you rely on Josh Allen, you should get Foster in there. It's been quiet for the last two hours with seven PPR points. The past five games, six receivers have scored 11 PPR points. Josh Reynolds. Reynolds missed off a monster game in Week 15 against the Eagles when he fell just short of the goal line by one yard in the second half. He still has a season high 12 targets to go in with five carries, catches. He's been a part. His he has at least seven targets in the past four games. Even with Jared Cole struggling heading into Week 16 against the Cardinals with Robert Woods and Brand Cooks and Gurley mostly dying touches, I still like Reynolds as the number three receiver. Deshaun Hamilton. In PPR leagues, Hamilton could be considered the must-start option against the Week against Oakland. Given his production over the last two weeks in the first two games without Emmanuel Sanders, Hamilton has 21 targets and 14 catches. Um, then finally, Antonio Callaway. Callaway is either 80 receiving yards or a touchdown in his past four games, including 12 against Cincinnati. Baker Mayfield's leading on Callaway with at least five targets. Um, for the tight ends, Chris Henderson. Henderson's gone six weeks in a row to well, score a touchdown, but he's, in, but, but he's essentially number two receiver behind Anderson. And similar to Darnell McGuire and Anderson, and Ander, Anderson Hender. Hendern is facing a Packers defense that has nothing to play for in the game on the road. Green Bay has allowed a tight end to score two of his past five touchdowns. Everett has shown flashes of being Garrett, uh, Gerald Everett. Everett has shown flashes of being a solid fast option in Week 15 against the Eagles. He had five catches for 46 yards on seven targets. He could have scored the touchdown on an end road from Goff, although it appears like Everett might be turned the wrong way on his route. Also, he needs to know he has to get out of the clock management simulations. He now has seven targets in consecutive games. It's worth a look to deeper leagues at Week 16. Ian Thomas. Thomas was terrible in Week 15 against New Orleans with just two catches for 14 targets, but everyone not named Christian McCaffrey struggled with the Saints. A lot of quarterbacks struggled. Drew Brees has struggled. Um, Tom Brady has struggled. Jared Goff struggling. Blake Jarrett has been not Blake Jarrett. He's been a, 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 been a number three receiver option for Dallas. You have Mari Koopa and Ezekiel Elliott, especially with Brisley hurt. He has seven targets in each of the past two games against Philadelphia and Indianapolis. He's converted them into 11 catches. This week he's facing the Tampa Bay defense that struggled with the tight ends in the season. There have been at least 13 tight ends with at least four targets the, against the Buccaneers. Finally, Matt Lacrosse. Lacrosse is worth a filler in deeper leagues given the matchup. With the Raiders, Oakland leads the NFL in fantasy points allowed in tight, tight ends, and Lacrosse is coming off the game against, where he is featured in Week 15 against Cleveland. He has a season high in six targets against the Browns and finished with four catches for 30 yards. And Week Two against the Raiders, Keenum leaned on his tight ends, which were Jake Butt and and Jeff Heron at the time, for six catches for 58 yards. Lacrosse, Lacrosse has been will hopefully get a healthy amount of targets this week. He went to J Red Show. Um, on to some hockey. Who are the best four duos in 2018-2019? Um, well, let's flash back to this November 2nd. The Canucks will put the most entertaining matches in the Rogers Arena against playoff team. This is a playoff team. In that game, Elias Peterson and, um, posted five points, including the game-time goal against Colorado. This was the ninth game. He was 19 years old. His new linemate, Brock Borso, had his best game of the season with two goals and four points. That's a fear because Paris and Borso made everything, everyone forget that the Canucks recently lost 12 or 13 games with that performance against the Blues. Uh, Paris and Borso could be one of the best forward combos in the league. This is the one concern about Petty and, and the Flow's production is that they, the shooting percentage is likely unsustainable. Together and 5-on-5, five five, their shooting percentage is up 17.5%. When Paris and Borso are out together, Petty shoot at 9.5%. Sebastian Ho and Tim Turn and Michael Furlan was fantastic with the early season, but it's Lucas Walmart riding the shotgun now. Still, when Ho and Tevin are on the ice, the hurricane shot ge- generation is off the charts. Johnny Goudreau and Sean Monahan. Elias Lindholm has turned this into one of the hockey's best lines, and is the major reason why Goudreau and Mohan don't make the not to the list as one of the top best duos. Apart from Lindholm and a 5 on 5, just under 100 minutes, Gradus and Moham production absolute creators. Jamie Benn and Tyler Sagan. In 130 minutes, even strength minutes away from Roberto and Ben and Sugis production drops drastically. Taylor Hall and Nico Hischer. Similar to the Gradu and Monahan duo, the Hall and Hischer play great together. But premier impact cannot be understated. Bray Kentucky and Matt Mark Stone. There's no denying that Kentucky and Stone have been an absolute force for Ottawa together on the ice this season. 